Hi, everyone. So this week, we're going to be looking at energy generation. Now, already in this course, we looked at air pollution, right? We started by talking about those criteria pollutants. Then we looked at a, a essentially a subset of air pollution, which is greenhouse gas emissions and their effect on climate change and the ramifications of that. And if we think about it, we can see that a link between them is energy and energy generation, right? If we, if we look at our criteria pollutants, if we look at our greenhouse gases, we see that the burning of fossil fuels to create energy, whether it's electricity or fuel to power our cars, is creating the emissions that are leading to human health risks and our changing climate, right? So if we're serious about cutting down on air pollution, cutting down on carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, we need to look at energy and how we create energy and how we can change that um, to reduce those things. So that's what this week is going to be about. We're going to start with this first lecture, um, going over some basics of what electricity is, how we measure it and generate it and distribute it. We're going to talk about conventional electricity sources, basically the sources of electricity that we have used for the past hundred odd years or so. And then we're going to talk uh, about oil as well as a source of energy, a little bit uh, apart from electricity generation. And then in part two, we're going to shift and we're going to talk about renewable energy, right? Where we can go uh, in the future away from this fossil fuel based um, energy. So to start, let's get some background. Uh, we're not going to go too in depth, right, in our uh, physics or chemistry here. Uh, but I just want a little bit of background so you guys have an understanding of really what electricity is and how uh, we generate it and, and distribute it to uh, across the country or across the world. So if we're talking about electricity, essentially what it is, is the flow of electrons from one atom to another in an organized way. And this is really an electrical current. If you remember from perhaps a chem class or possibly physics class, I don't recall if we've learned this in physics, um, but an atom, right, is made up of smaller subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Neutrons have a neutral charge, protons have a positive charge, electrons have a negative charge. Those protons and neutrons exist in the nucleus, which is at the center or core of our atom. And surrounding that nucleus in different shells are electrons, right? And the, the amount of electrons and protons and neutrons varies depending on the atom, et cetera. What also is important is that those electrons aren't necessarily stable where they are, right? They can move to different shells, outer shells or inner shells, and they could also move from atom to atom. Right? And this is also the, the likelihood of this happening uh, is dependent on a number of factors as well, particularly the type of, of atom that you have. So um, when those electrons bounce, from atom to atom, that is a flow of electrons like we're talking about, and that is electricity, right? And it's probably easier seen in this little diagram that you have here. In this case, this could be a, a battery right here, and here's a light bulb, and we're gonna power that light bulb. Well, what's happening is um, this battery is creating an electrical current. And like we said, uh, electricity is simply a flow of electrons. So we use typically copper wire because the, the makeup of copper atoms lends itself to electrons bouncing from atom to atom. And that's what you see here, right? These are, think of these as different atoms and the electron is gonna bounce from atom to atom. And as it does that, it creates this flow. And that ultimately is what is gonna power our light bulb, right? And how incandescent light bulbs actually work is, so this is copper wire where these electrons can bounce really easily from atom to atom. But once we get into our light bulb, it crosses over. This is typically tungsten, right? Which um, is much more difficult for those electrons to, to bounce or to move across atoms. And as a result, it creates heat. And as that, that metal heats up, it glows. And that's what uh, essentially creates light in, in your light bulb, right? It's just heat. That's why your incandescent light bulbs will feel hot after they've been on for a while. But that's essentially electricity. It's a flow of electrons. It's a flow of electrons really from, from atoms in this organized way. 
So before we get into how we generate it and distribute it, I do want to take a moment to talk about how we measure electricity because this is going to um, it's going to play a role. It's good and common knowledge to have, and it's going to we're going to need to know some of these terms when we talk about particularly distribution of electricity. So there's kind of three main measurements: volts, amps, and watts. And perhaps an easy way to uh, think about them is to compare them to water flowing through a pipe, right? So volts are our electric potential, or you can think of it as electrical pressure. It's measuring how strongly electricity is being pushed through a circuit, and it's synonymous with water pressure, right? You can think of uh, if you have a hose or a pipe, that water pressure is how strong uh, that water is being pushed through that pipe. Same with volts. It's how strong those electrons are being pushed through a circuit. Now, amps is a measure of current, and this is synonymous with water flow, right? Amps is measuring how many electrons are moving past a spot every second, and that would be synonymous with water flow, which is measuring the amount of water that's flowing past a spot over a given time period. Right, so volts is the pressure, amps is a measure of how many electrons are moving, and then watts is a combination of those two. Right, It's how much electrical power is being generated. If you take into consideration um, the pressure right, uh, of electrons being uh, forced through and how many are traveling through, you can combine those and that's going to tell you how much actual power is being produced. Again, if we're using this analogy with water, you can take the water pressure and the amount of water, and that is going to dictate how fast a water wheel would spin and essentially how much work you could do with that water wheel. So three important measurements of electricity. How do we actually generate it, right? The, what we need to be aware of is that electricity and magnetism are linked. And in fact, we refer to the, the force uh, as the electromagnetic force. And it's one of these four fundamental forces that you find in physics. And it's actually responsible for basically all phenomena that occurs above the nuclear scale, with the exception of gravity. But like I said, electricity and magnetism are linked. And if you've ever had uh, maybe done this experiment when you were younger, um, you take a uh, copper wire, wrap it around a nail, attach each side to a battery, and that creates a magnet, an electromagnet, right? And that's this principle that we see here of electromagnetism. If you apply a current to a wire, it will create a magnetic field. And that's that uh, what you see right up here. But importantly, the opposite is also true. So if you create motion in a magnetic field, right? For instance, you can take this magnet and move it back and forth across this uh, coiled loop of wire. Creating that motion in that magnetic field will create an electric current, right? It's the exact opposite. If you create a current, it's going to create a magnetic field. If you create motion in a magnetic field, it's going to create an electric current. And we refer to this as electromagnetic induction. And this is one of the primary ways that we generate electricity, right? So if we look at an electrical generator, you'll see that it is, at least a simplification, there are two main parts. There's a rotor and a stator. Now that rotor spins inside of the stator, and that rotor is going to be an electric, uh, uh, an electric magnet. Um, the stator also uh, is magnetized as well. And by rotating that rotor, right, we're creating that motion in our uh, magnetic field, and that's going to create a current or create electricity. And that's essentially how a majority of our electricity is generated, right? We are creating motion in a magnetic field, which creates an electrical current. But in order to create that motion, right, we need to move that rotor. So how does that happen? Well, we largely use steam. Right, it's actually quite simple. We burn fossil fuels, or starting in the 50s, we induced nuclear fission, and that heated up water, and that water turned to steam, and then that steam would spin a turbine, which is connected to that rotor, and that spins that rotor, and that creates that motion in that magnetic field, and that creates electricity. And that is essentially how a majority of our electricity is created. 
right? It's creating, we're just heating up water to create steam to spin that turbine, to spin that rotor, and that is it, right? Now, like I said, this accounts for about 80% of our electricity generation. We refer to this as thermal power, and it's how we've created energy or electricity for the past 100 odd years. So then we've created it, how do we actually distribute it? And to distribute it, we use what is referred to as the electrical or the power grid. Now there's actually uh, some interesting things about the power grid. We don't have time to get too deep into it. Um, one of the things to, to be aware of is that we utilize AC current in the power grid as opposed to DC. Uh, DC is uh, direct current, while AC is alternating current. And essentially what that means is with direct current, those electrons are flowing in the same direction continuously, right? Like a, like a big loop you can think of it as. Whereas in AC current, those electrons flow back and forth uh, both directions. If you want to get more into it, I have two links down there that you guys can, uh, can check out. But why it's important to, to know is uh, why we use AC current is because we're able to change the voltage of the current easily or more easily than DC. And remember, voltage is like that water pressure. It is the electrical potential or electric pressure, right? So if we need to transport electricity long distances, just like if we wanted to transport water long distances, we could increase the water pressure. We need to do the same with electricity. So we need to increase the voltage. And we're able to do that much easier with alternating current, which is why we utilize it in our transmission lines. So what happens is our power plant generates our electricity, right, through that spinning of that rotor. And then we have transformers that um, pump up the voltage, right, and they increase the voltage. And then we have high voltage transmission lines that carry that electricity to where it needs to go. That voltage gets decreased once it starts going towards more residential areas, and we have more residential power lines that have a lower voltage. There's another transformer uh, even on those lines that can, can decrease it even further when it runs to your house, and you get about 110 volts that are coming into your house. That's essentially how the grid works. Now, uh, and when we talk about renewables in the next lecture, we'll go a little bit more talking about the grid and the need to upgrade it, right? This grid is was largely um, created in the 50s and 60s, and it works well with our uh, forms of energy in the, that we were using in the 50s and 60s, right? Fossil fuels primarily. But as we've uh, advanced into different types of electricity generation, which we'll talk about, um, we need to update this grid to accommodate them and some of the issues associated with them that are different than... Um, traditional or conventional electricity generation. But we'll talk a little bit about more, uh, more of that in the next lecture. For now, I just want you to have an idea of how this, how this grid works. An important thing to note too, is that, you know, this, the, there's, there's not really storage of electricity either, right? So when you flick on that light switch, if you're at home and you turn on a light, plug in your laptop or your phone, that electricity is being generated at that moment, essentially, right? So it's not like we're creating this electricity and we're storing it anywhere and then we can utilize it. It's being created and used in real time. So there are people that are monitoring these lines constantly to make sure um, that the we are having enough electricity generation and it's being delivered properly. So um, again, when we talk about how we can improve this, one of the ways that we're looking at doing is to making more of a smart grid that we have sensors and artificial intelligence that is better able to um, deal with uh, demand and supply um, uh, faster than uh, we have in the past. Anyway, we'll get more into that in the next lecture. Uh, so in the United States, we have two main power grids and then one kind of offshoot, right? So you have your Eastern interconnect that services the Eastern half of the country, the Western interconnect that services the Western half, and they can interact with each other as well. And then you have your kind of oddball, the Texas interconnect uh, that is kind of stands alone. Now, there are ways for these to actually interconnect as well, um, but they don't, it's a, it's a little more difficult, right? 
And if you've paid attention to the news with Texas and some of the issues they had with their energy, part of that is because they are isolated and it's harder for them to get access to energy if something goes wrong. So um, just uh, information on the different types of grid that, that we find here in the United States. And again, the need um, to have to update this is as we're going to see when we when we look at renewables and where energy is produced, we need to have reliable transmission lines that can cross these state boundaries and, and travel long distances uh, and to be able to access new areas for new areas of electricity generation that we haven't seen in the past. So we need we're going to need to update this uh, going forward in the future. So that's kind of some basic background information, right? What electricity is, how we measure it, how we generate it, how we distribute it through that grid. Let's now take a look at our conventional electricity sources. My conventional, again, these are the sources of electricity that we have used um, really historically, primarily our fossil fuel base. So if we're talking about the U.S., we produce approximately 4 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity in 2020. And again, remember watts is that total. It takes in, uh, it, it is the combination of voltage and amps. It's essentially the energy or the amount of work, right, you can do with that electricity. So we produce 4 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity in 2020. And an additional 41.7 billion produced from small scale photovoltaic or small scale solar systems found on homes or or businesses, parking garages, et cetera. So of that utility scale electricity generation, 40% of it was produced by natural gas. 20%, almost 20% by coal, almost 20% or 20% by nuclear, and then 20% by renewables. Now this is different than what it would have been only a couple of years ago, right? Only a couple of years ago, it would have been a uh, majority produced by coal a little bit by natural gas, 20% by nuclear has been pretty standard, uh, and only a little bit by renewables. So we are, if we are talking about um, decarbonizing our grid, right, trying to get away from fossil fuels, or at least get away from uh, emissions, we are moving in the right steps. We are utilizing more renewables. We have switched primarily from coal to natural gas, which while natural gas isn't the be all end all solution, um, it is cleaner in terms of emissions and air pollution than coal. So we are moving in a, in a better way than we have in the past. So like I said, coal was historically the main uh, electricity source for many, many years. And it really peaked in about the, in the 2000s, where we saw the largest demand in coal. And this was largely um, related to growth in China. Right. So China has had uh, incredible growth and development over the past um, couple decades. And with that growth and development, they needed more energy and they uh, and they had higher energy demands and they they um, satisfied those energy demands by building coal power plants. And uh, they built uh, numerous coal power plants and they were like, like I say up here. Uh, were a huge source of the global growth in coal consumption. Now, they are starting to transition away from that a little bit, right? Uh, in 2010, about 80% of their electricity came from coal. It's down to about 58% now. So they are starting to diversify. But they are continuing to build new coal plants to meet their developmental goals. Um, however, they, they've pledged to hit their emissions peak or their CO2 emissions peak by 2030 and to be carbon neutral by 2060. So they are still pushing coal. It is still their main electricity source, um, although they are transitioning in a way. And they do say that by 2060, they will be carbon neutral. We'll see how that goes, uh, how that goes. Right. And again, as we already talked about, you know, if we're talking about sources of energy or electricity, we Coal's not the best in terms of pollution, right? It produces more pollutants than our other fossil fuels in terms of those criteria pollutants, in terms of carbon dioxide. So we really want to get away from utilizing coal. In the U.S., um, we have done that as well. Our coal consumption peaked in 2007 and 2008. 
and it's been declining since. And you can see that in the graph that I have over there. That bottom part is coal. And you can see it's really declined recently. And that is due to a number of factors. One is the shale revolution, so the ability to access natural gas through these shale formations. And that made natural gas much cheaper and uh, cleaner electricity, and uh, there's been the shift towards that. We've also seen the rise of wind and solar power, which is uh, becoming a larger share of this electricity market, and these push towards carbon neutral, right, to get away from uh, using fossil fuels as electricity. So in the future, where coal is going to be is going to depend largely on the global market and a couple developing nations, right? What China, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, um, even parts of Africa, these developing nations, where they decide to go with their, ener with their energy or their electricity sources is going to determine what happens with coal. Right. If they decide to use coal as their primary electricity source or if they try to go for more renewables, it's going to dictate what happens here. So that was coal. Now let's talk about natural gas, right? Our other big fossil fuel that we utilize for electricity generation. And we saw in the B in a couple of slides ago, it's about 40 percent of our electricity generation now in the U.S. Right. We have gone from being coal based to natural gas based. Now, there are benefits of that, right? It is, there's lots of natural gas. We have hundreds of years worth of natural gas that's available to us. Um, it is cleaner than coal, right? So it produces less emissions. You can see down here, right? It produces less emissions than burning coal, but it's still producing emissions, both carbon dioxide and those other criteria pollutants that we talked about. So it's not completely clean. There are some other environmental effects as well, right? To get at to get at this natural gas, we use that process, that drilling technique called fracking. And fracking can be, um, it produces toxic waste or toxic wastewater that must be disposed of. And if it's not disposed of properly, that can lead to uh, large environmental effects, right? And if the drilling isn't done correctly, it could lead to these uh, really large scale environmental uh, problems. While drilling, we can also uh, encounter methane leakage, right? So methane is that gas, that greenhouse gas, really potent. It can, these pockets could build up around coal beds and around these shale beds. And when you're drilling, we can release that methane into the atmosphere. So while it's better than coal, it's not without its problems or its environmental problems. And going forward, really, we could utilize natural gas as this transition towards cleaner energy sources. Right. So to get away from coal and to use it as an interim. And that's kind of where we see natural gas right now. Now, there are some problems with that. Right. To to utilize natural natural gas, you do need an infrastructure. Right. So you need the, the pipelines and the power plants and all of that. And this may act as a disincentive to going further into renewables. Right. If you build up this infrastructure for natural gas and you start creating energy from it and we have a lot of it available, then there may not be that larger push to keep going to even cleaner renewable um, energy sources. So it's why there, is, there are some folks that um, are for natural gas for this exact reason, as this transition reason, but there are some folks who are against it because they, they fear that by focusing on natural gas, it's going to take away from focusing on really what should we should be looking at, which are renewables. So, um, and that's something that does need to be considered, right? If I think most scientists would agree that natural gas is this really good transition step, but taking into account human behavior and politics, uh, sociology, et cetera, there is the fear that if we focus too much on natural gas, we'll never get to that renewable as well. So something to be aware of. Another main conventional electricity source, at least since the 50s, is nuclear. So nuclear power plants began in 1957, and they grew basically each year through 1990. They kind of leveled off after 2000, and now we're seeing a decommissioning of nuclear plants. But while there are fewer plants that are operating than in the past, we're still seeing um, about 20% of our electricity generation being produced through nuclear, and that is due to technological advancements, right? So while we don't have as many nuclear power plants, we're still seeing as much electricity produced by by them because though they're getting more efficient. 
Now, again, if we are talking about trying to go carbon free, nuclear is zero emissions, right? It does not emit those air pollutants or that carbon dioxide that that natural gas and coal do produce. And it's also an on-demand energy source. One of the issues that we're going to see when we look at our renewables or some of them, particularly wind and solar, is that they're not always on demand. There are times when it's cloudy. There are times when the wind isn't blowing as much. And we are used to this on-demand energy source. We want to be able to turn on our lights and or flick that switch and have our lights turn on, right? And we're able to do that with fossil fuels, right? Coal and, and natural gas, as well as nuclear. Right. And this kind of goes, as we'll talk about, this kind of goes to that problem of energy storage. Uh, we don't really store our energy. It needs to be produced and then used. And nuclear allows us to do this in a way that is zero emissions. Which is all good, right? Those are, are two good things. But again, with a lot of stuff, there is a debate on where nuclear fits into our electricity generation in the future. Just because it's on demand and it's zero emissions there are other factors that we need to take into account as to whether we want this going forward, right? One of which is safety. And again, there's debate amongst safety, right? There are people that um, are more concerned about nuclear safety. There are others that uh, say, if you look at the facts, it's actually safer than coal or natural gas. Um, I think one of the issues is that when there are problems with nuclear, they are large um, uh, very visible problems, right? So if there is, is an issue with a nuclear reactor, it's it's a, essentially a large-scale disaster, right? And you can think of the ones that we've had in history, Chernobyl, right? Huge large-scale disaster, Fukushima uh, in, back in 2011 in Japan, even Three Mile Island that occurred in uh, Pennsylvania. So when there are issues with nuclear, there are these big issues. Uh, and there's that fear of that radioactivity. And there's also a big issue concerning nuclear waste, right? So nuclear fuel remains dangerously radioactive for thousands of years after it's no longer useful. And we do not have a long-term storage site, right? Back in the 80s, we passed an act where we were supposed to identify and put into action as a storage site by 1998, and it is 2022, and we have yet to do it. And there's various reasons for why, right? Logistically, politically, a little bit of it is like, you know, that not in my backyard aspect where we all recognize we need a, a storage site for nuclear, but no state actually wants to have that, um, right? Because it doesn't look good and there's fears uh, behind it as well. Uh, so we've yet to come up with a, 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 a satisfiable long-term storage site. And that's something that really needs to be developed. And it's something that we need to do if we are going to utilize nuclear going into the future. And part of your homework this week is to actually read about nuclear and kind of talk about what you think, right? Should this be an energy source in the future? So those are our three main electricity generating sources, right? Coal, natural gas, and nuclear. We're going to talk now about oil or petroleum. Now, oil does not make up a huge percent of how we generate electricity. Right. It's maybe one percent of our electricity generation. But if we are talking about energy consumption, just total energy, not just electricity, it is a huge portion of our energy consumption, more so than our other ones that we talked about, more so than natural gas and nuclear and coal and renewables. Right. About 35 percent of our energy consumption comes from oil. And this is because we use oil for fuel. Right. About 70 percent of our oil goes for fuel to power our vehicles in the transportation sector. And if we are serious about cutting down emissions, we need to address oil as um, as a way to do that. Right. Or, or what we can do as fuel um, to cut down our emissions, because if you look down here at 2019, our emissions uh, most of our emissions by sector came from the transportation sector, right? It's the burning of of oil or refined forms of oil, right? Gasoline. That is contributing largely to our emissions. So we need to come up with alternatives for or fuel alternatives if we are really serious about cutting down 
on our carbon emissions or going carbon neutral uh, in the future. And that is something that we are going to look at uh, in the next uh, lecture when we look at part two. So that's essentially for it, right? I wanted to give you guys some background on electricity, some of our conventional, mostly fossil fuel based uh, electricity and energy sources. And now going forward in part two, we're going to look at renewables and where we can go in the future to really decarbonize this entire sector uh, and make it more environmentally friendly. So that is it. I will see you guys in the next lecture.